Creativity Inc. Yes. All right. So Creativity Inc. It's one of the biggest marathon books that is out there in order to understand how and why creativity is important to be fostered in an organization. It's a book that you will not be able to get everything out of in one read. All of us, the sprinters, know this. And you will also find out that there is so much wealth of knowledge that Ed has put in this one book that looks deceptively very small to read, but it is a mammoth in itself. But bringing it closer to home, why should you read this book? You'll understand how to overcome unforeseen. You'll understand how to make decisions in the face of change, which is continuous in our times. You'll understand how you can build a creativity culture, which ensures that everyone feels inclusive and has skin in the game. You'll understand how to lead creative teams because we all know all creative people out there are a bunch of extremely emotional and extremely vocal people. So you'll understand how to lead those as well. Last but not the least, embracing and learning from failure because none of us are new to it and none of us will ever be away from it because as a group, this group is all about trying new things. So failure is always going to be there. But how do you overcome it? That's what this book is definitely going to give you. What does it cover? A little bit of what I've already said, but some really big pegs. How to build sustainable creative workspaces because that job is never done. It's a continuous job. You keep doing it. You keep iterating. You keep learning. That's what this book covers. Why to build candor in development process. Honesty has baggage. You'll see more about it when one of our printers covers it. But yes, candor is something that's possible. That's what you'll find out. And why is it important to foster? How to develop systems to create balance between production constraints and expand creativity. We're all familiar with the little bit of high and lows that inter-departments have. How do you manage that? How do you manage those constraints? And you still keep on expanding creativity is one of the key pegs and threads that runs throughout this book. Ideas can come from anywhere. We've seen that in the form of the book. We see in, in the form of the movies. And we see that in the form of germination processes and ideas and instances that Ed says within this book, which is why it's corroborated that ideas can always come from anywhere. Last but not the least, excellence, quality, and good are earned and not proclaimed. It talks about why your work should talk about it, and these are the adjectives that people should, should reward you with. Four of the sprinters out here, Kalyani, Shubham, myself, Malasi, and Prakriti. Over to you guys. Let's get this. So hi, everyone. The first big idea is all about the core of this book. So what do you do? When you have a creative block strikes to your team or to, to you, even you, you are in any field, any creative field or any as a like management field, have you been stuck with a, like maybe a blank, uh, what to do now? You don't have any answers like, like you see, you see in, the, in the GIF. So have you been there? So like you all must have experienced some kind of blockage in your life. So what to do? This, this is what exactly happened with the Pixel when they launched a successful toy story in the first launch and they want to prequel it like, like the sequel of this Toy Story 2 where they just lose the plot of the whole story because of the high success of the first one because they had, don't have much budget because uh, they have been acquired by uh, Disney by the time uh, after the successful launch of their Toy Story 1 and time was running and creative team was stuck. So what they did, so they, so they took a break, they brainstormed and they come up with a like a solution which is a uh, biggest IPO ever. Okay. So they won it and the, it was the largest IPO ever. So what can we learn from this whole story where they solved this creative fix uh, about creating a sustainable culture in a creative team? That's called a brain trust. A brainstorming with trust evolved as a team where we put you, you put some experts of, uh, of, of your ex, uh, like expert of the team in a relaxed offside break. Just give a, some uh, re, like a rigorous review session with them and with the candor. So what is candor? Candor is like giving feedback on a very uh, like hard fact find way without having like no biases there. So candor review to gain trust among the peer and 
with zero authority. Like there is no solutioning, only the like, understanding the problem. So just discussing the idea. Okay. So where ideas are encouraged, reviewed, and scrutinized, but with candor while giving the feedback and through a proper note, written notes, so that the team must refer, go back to them, refer them. And there are some principles. They 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 channelize it. They they fundamentally prescribed some uh, like made into some principle. So what are those principles? Understood some underlying principle principles like remove the power structure. The the moment you remove the power structure, the ego will go away. So the the directors of the film or the experts will not come with with a like in a defensive mode. They'll start listening the re reviews and the feedback in an open mode. Just listen the ideas, improve upon your peer reviews to, to like colleague to colleague, filmmaker to filmmaker. Share your success stories, share your failure stories among, among that group so that people will learn from your failure, people will learn from your success and collectively whole group will improve and kind of successfully remove that blockage. And finally, give your honest uh, candor opinion right in, in, without non-bias on a written note so that people can refer them, come back to it again and again, because you are not, we are not recommending any solution to them. We are just giving our own unbiased feedback so that the next time they will come for a brain trust meeting, they will come, uh, at least they some, show some progress. So that is what is brain trust. And in the famous quote with Andrew Stanton, who is the director of Finding an Emo, very famous uh, animation movie. He said, if Pixar is a hospital and the movies are patients, then the brain trust would be made up of experienced doctors. It's like the, the bunch of doctors examining a particular patient and the other senior doctors are advising him not to concluding the, the because uh, treatment because the patient is his own, his patients. So they, they, they can just recommend the another line of treatment. So that's uh, the, the whole brain test idea for you. And the second big idea is about the change is the only constant. So no matter what you do in, in the creative field, the creative is the only creativity is the only way to adapt to the dynamic responsivity to the environment. When you don't adapt to change, you fail. And the classic example is the Kodak is reluctant to change and market succeed them with the higher technological investment and the business model. Their business models are like they are not ready to change the business model of selling that old tapes. And the whole game changed when the digital camera came. Working with change is all about the like creativity, creativity is all about. As you can see, if you start like selling the albums through the tapes or through the CDs, but the music industry has evolved, changed itself through a drastically like timeline where you started from the gramophone and now you have iTunes and you're streaming the music from the internet. So that was is like, like it's all about change. Similarly, change is the fundamental in storytelling. If you think you go static, story will die. That's why as a creative team, we need to keep on adapting to change. And that, that's what will make you live like you live creative. People are greater than ideas. This statement doesn't digest well, does it? We often see great companies coming with great ideas and we assume that ideas are the source of their greatness. But what we do not see, what is what goes behind the scenes, the making of the greatness the toil and the hard work of the team, the people who are making the idea work. To translate the above equation, every uh, great teams build great ideas and those are more important. Let's take a concept idea for a movie. A movie that goes inside your head and shows emotions at play. How and how one's personality gets developed. Sounds insanely complex, right? But it exists. Yes. We are talking about Inside Out by Pixar. Uh, it was Pete and his team who made this idea come to life and made it so simple that even a kid knows what's going on on the screen. So Ed Catmull speaks about a mediocre team will screw up a great, uh, good idea. Whereas a brilliant team with a mediocre idea can make the idea better or can drop it or can just fix what's not working. But the question remains, what makes teams good? Hiring the right people who make the team chemistry great. It's a easy one. But the more, what is most important is 
trusting the people you hire you have to find and develop and support the right people and they in turn will find develop and own good idea so the next time you are working on something new remember is the team that's making the innovation great so to conclude ideas come from people and people are greater than the idea so the next big idea talks about mistakes mistakes are not equal to failure many equate them and are on continuous pressure to avoid them at all costs but we have to remember that mistakes are inevitable when it comes to uncharted path they aren't the necessary evil let's take an example nobody has bought a bicycle and went on racing the next day unless you already know how to ride a bicycle the point is no one just tries something new and becomes the master of it let's see what ha- actually happens uh, one gets a brand new cycle then with some help and support you start paddling and there is a very likely chance that you will miss balance and fall and that's okay because then you get up and try again for most of the cases nobody even remembers the fall because you are al- already cycling around the point is you don't learn to do something new as basic as cycling without feeling first then how do you uh, believe to achieve something in a creative environment let's compare this scenario the cycle is something uh, for new idea the girl is the creative of the team initially she need, she needs some support and cheering up from her team and she goes ahead and makes a mistake and just like the previous scenario falling off the bicycle was okay here creative make, uh, making the mistake is also okay but before all of this happen many get stuck into a phase let's go ahead and see what's that phase is many get stuck in the planning phase i know i do too we all want to plan out to the nitty gritty of things to minimize and at times avoid the mistakes at all costs but in doing so we are just stalling and it's going to take longer to go wrong <laughs> and in doing so you are getting too attached to the idea because you have planned every nitty gritty of that uh, concept to execute and in turn hurting you more when the idea doesn't go your way after all that planning how dare it in the book author mentions rather than going around preventing error go around and enable people in your team to remedy their mistakes Uh, rather than trying to prevent all errors we should always assume that people's intentions were good and they wanted to solve the problem give them the responsibility let the mistakes happen and let them fix it management job is not to prevent risk but to build the ability to recover it to conclude fear is an evil at all it is a necessary consequence of doing something new and that is a good thing you may remember that whenever a mishapening happens it's a, a split second decision and observation of pulling the chain and that decision makes the difference uh, that is one of our decisions that we took in a mishapening as we go ahead we will realize in the system of and and cord the same chain is pulled up but initially there was a difference in the system there was a hierarchy in which the, that decision was held only by the people who had higher power but now uh, there was a change and this idea was brought up by goa by edwards deming and uh, pixar actively involves it in their projects is that they value each employee's perspective and how do they do it by giving them the decision making power by trusting in their problem solving power so the, as mentioned in the other, uh, previous slide that it's the question of should i or should not it is about you don't have to ask permission to take responsibility if there is a problem that you identify that isn't your direct responsibility you can take ownership and solve the problem in the same way peer based and failure averse cultures avoid risk they repeat what has been good enough in the past that is something that we might even realize when we observe different systems that when like when we succumb to our systems we reach a certain amount of success but there will be an improbable situation that comes up an uncertain event take uh, take a decision solve the problem when an uncertain problems come up so ed catmull has said it's not a manager's job to prevent risk it's the manager's job to make it safe for others to take them yeah and in this most important point comes in that as employees we need to experiment experiments are seen as productive and necessary 
one of the major takeaways from this system of uh, andun ford is that we realize and toyota uh, principle is that that to demonstrate leadership we need to respond well to failure and we need to trust our employees to be problem solvers now i will be going to the next idea of the broadening the view so we might realize that organizations perceive the world with what they know and do we have certain preconceived notions we have certain systems we have certain biases and we generally act upon them but do we do give realize do, do we realize that like building ideas like pixar means going out of those ideas going out of that box going out of those constraints that we have in this specific book if you go through it you will realize that there are different systems that uh, Uh, Ed Catmull has given one of them has been discussed like uh, uh, brain trust has been given and there are many more systems and one of the major systems like many uh, subheadings but like one major chunk of it is talking about how there are feedback sessions involved in it that we create our own words and that is not det- uh, limited by one restricted uh, perspective. it we constantly keep expanding by different systems like researching experiencing if you will go and research more you will realize that in ratatouille those people went in and saw them how they cooked ratatouille in brave they went to like shoot arrows and like boar king like kills and it was that made me realize that even when you see an art board a story board you would realize that to create an animation there would be one bias that we have so a stereotypical drawing would be the first draft but after that to add details we have to experience it we have to create another world in which the characters exist and the ideas are built and in that we build a captivating story and as you can see in this specific gif like that this expression in this character was the that something that i think so pixar always wanted to like bring in us as audience as individuals and even we want to derive it from people and from uh, like well from when we deliver our products we want to get, gain that reaction from our customers what's the biggest threat that all of us have seen to the status quo it's the change that the new things bring right we've all been in situations where the new has been difficult to advocate for just look at this visual would you advocate for how big a tree this is going to sprout into just by looking at the size of the seed you can't predict that unless you have some really super powers naturally it's difficult to advocate in this situation but new just because new doesn't have the proof that backs it doesn't mean we don't listen to it if you plant a seed it's going to and keep taking it out after every few days you're not going to see this kind of a growth because you're hampering the growth you're not giving it the right environment you're not giving it the right factors to blossom into what it can pixar like any other organization struggled with these things new ideas would always not find the kind of buy in that it would be required one of the examples and one of the favorite examples that the author which is ed says is there was a shoe string budget something that all of us are familiar with tight deadlines every single person knows this the need to train people or should we bring in the experienced people the classic debate every single organization goes through it ed like anyone was struggling to figure out how to bring in an internship program that would sound viable and valuable every single department head was in buying in so to make sure that this new idea was not the devil not the enemy he decided to take it into stride he took it up as a corporate expense he said all right let me just bring in a very small team i'm going to get eight interns all of those interns are going to be taken care of as in, as a corporate expense i'm not asking you guys for a budget all you have to do is just take them in for any project that you're running the result of that surprised not just the department head but even ed every single person wanted to grab these interns because what these interns brought was zeal enthusiasm and something that every experienced person has they did not have the lo- the baggage to unlearn they knew, they could just be polished they could just be told what they had to do and the pixar rules the pixar values were absorbed like osmosis it was flabbergasting for everybody and out of those eight interns seven of them returned to be full time employees at pixar that's a, that's something that struck everyone 
and in no time this internship program became what it is today it's one of the most coveted internship programs in the creative field they have brought it up to 100 to a 100 seat limit but they get thousands of applications every single year today this program is what it is because ed realized that this idea this new idea needed the time to germinate to find its footing and get the buy in from every single person and the budget constraint every single department was more than happy to absorb it into their budget because they saw the value in it no one's asking you to change the day to day and make way for changes every single time business has to go as usual you can't do that but if you want the mango you got to let the seed become the tree which is why most organizations have r&d departments they let these ideas that are seeds get the get the incubation get the environment to foster into something that they have the potential of becoming so as leaders as product leads as designers what we need to do is be the protector of the new that is one of the bigger ideas of this book protect the new give the time to not so great to emerge into the great you take the new you take a risk this is going to happen nobody is a stranger to failure every single person in our lives on this call whoever is going to watch this video is familiar with failure failure is the territory of the people who try something new it's the feedback it's not the end result you don't stop there there are definite two definite outcomes for anything new right you're going to have a success or you're going to have a failure there's no third outcome so when we are coming from a culture where failure is coupled with so much shame as kids as corporates where we're penalized for being in the side of failure where we've not achieved the thing how do you still as an organization foster the culture of being there to support risk which is going to sometimes lead into failure and how do you come back from it pixar till date in the history of its time has only shot one movie and this happened because there were a series of meltdowns because they changed a couple of processes it was not a direct cause but it was a series of causes so they wanted to figure out what really happened to make sure that they do not disrupt the work they actually went away from the day to day took some time off took in the main leadership that understood pixar ethos like their own life ethos and sat down to figure out what was happening why was this a problem the biggest purpose that emerged for the pixar team from this meetup was that they are inevitably not going to be there around for the lifetime of pixar how do they make sure that the teams have the tools to be able to manage the inevitability of failure because whenever they try something new that's going to happen now there is an a mentorship program that emerged post this conversation they decided that each single management train management person is going to be paired up with the newer director who are the show runners for each movie they would not just concentrate on the bigger brain trust meetings but also onto the day to day improvements that would help ensure that these newer people are operating in the ethos of pixar the idea was again make sure that the pixar values transfer through osmosis the result is clear pixar com- continues to deliver hits without stifling the creativity culture it's one of the organizations where you can feel the palpable energy the moment you walk in it's actually simple of how they really decided to deal with this situation they broke down failure into two things the emotions of the event whenever something failed all of your emotions are valid they did not discard it they did not forget about it they did not eliminate it they felt all of that but the reaction which is the one thing that you can control is what they focused on they did not get together to figure out who to slap off or who to fire that's the telltale sign of an organization if all of you are rallying together to figure out how to move forward instead of finding the scapegoat you've got a great creative culture you're not stifling creativity you're not making it a fearsome place to be in you're not making it a place where the hallways are more honest as opposed to meeting halls you're building a culture where creativity thrives lives through every interaction and every collaboration if it's the former in your organization become the champion to be the person who can foster that creativity in whatever power you can 
that's what Pixar did. That's what they keep doing. And that's how they thrive. So how do you manage failure is how do you learn the most out of failure? That's what is the key idea that is a thread throughout this book. How does Pixar manage failure and how do they learn from it? So let's focus on the learning part, shall we? So this is not the big idea, but a small nugget, a small factor. Postmortem. It is not something dark as the name suggests. In fact, it is a uh, compulsory custom at Pixar that after uh, that they follow after completion of a new movie. But before we dive in, let's tackle a question. Why do we read fables? Uh, you may remember these from your childhood with morals at the end of each story. Morals which you may or may not have used at any time, but you certainly do remember. They help you make sense of what happened in the fa uh, fable, a kind of self-reflection of it. We can similarly adapt this self-reflecting mechanism in our team with more than one motive. Let's see how Pixar uses it. How are postmortems helpful? They help you consolidate uh, what you learned before you forget. They provide a rare opportunity to do the analysis that wasn't uh, possible in the heat of the project. They also help you teach uh, things to others who weren't there. It becomes very, it is a very helpful thing for people who weren't there and would want to know how it, they made it possible. They don't, uh, they don't let a resentment fester. Providing a forum to express frustration in a respective, uh, respectful manner helps people uh, let go of misunderstandings and screw ups and move on. Uh, and fourthly, uh, use schedule to uh, force reflection. The scheduling of postmortem alone uh, forces self reflection. The time spent preparing for the meeting is as valuable as the meeting itself. And lastly, paying it forward. A good postmortem arms people with right questions to go forward. To conclude, uh, no one, not Walt, not Steve, and not even people at Pixar ever achieved creative success by simply clinging to what used to work. They say that past should be your teacher and not your master. The dynamic response to changing environments is a must for creative teams. We need to also watch out for the areas where the balance is completely lost as well. So this is what um, Ed talks about as beasts. These are beasts that needs to be continuously fed with phenomenal resources, they guzzle it. But we need to see where these balance is getting lost in our day-to-day -day, um, operations. So how can we do that? And for that, he gives a beautiful tip which says that, Hold your goals lightly and hold your intentions firmly. So that's been one of the major takeaway for me from this particular big idea. As a team, we need to be open to um, the changes. We should be able to change our goals based on the new information that we are learning and that is coming in. And we should have the capacity to be surprised and let go of our assumptions. And that's what he talks about. And as a result of it, this beast is constantly fed, but it is taken care of. He also talks about the ugly babies, as uh, he calls it. The ugly babies are basically um, the unformed, uh, vulnerable, incomplete, not so complete work. So basically, when you are trying to uh, start with something, and this is typically the unknown. We don't know how it is going to grow. So the ugly baby needs a lot of nurturing. And as Manasvi showed her in her beautiful mango trees, we need to give that time. So he asks us to protect these ugly babies so that the, the bees don't kind of crush them. In all honesty, uh, for both, both the bees and the ugly babies to stay in the same environment, to coexist, that's one of the hardest things. So that is exactly where 
he talks about, hey, give time for the not so great to emerge into great. And at the same time, he talks about the true balance. It, he gives a new definition for this true balance, where the outcome and the payoffs are not yet apparent. So when we are able to manage both of it, that is what is true balance according to Ed. And having one foot in what is known and having one foot in what is unknown. And that's exactly how he asks us to balance. And comfort with the unknown is a big part of a creative endeavor. So we cannot shut out realities to keep things simple. But we will, if we need to excel, we need to keep these realities coming at us. So it is important to have both the balance as well as the unknown in the same you know, manner so that you will be able to tap for originality and inspiration through the unknowns. You will be able to keep running the engine through the beasts. So it was beautiful um, in terms of learning how to really run a creative team through uh, this brilliant idea. So with that, um, we are done with the 10 big ideas in the book. There is a lot more. This book takes at least, uh, it's about 384 pages. It takes about 10 hours to read. Go ahead and read. There are beautiful stories in it. But if you have some questions, uh, we should be able to answer some of those stories for you.